Our text for today is from John chapter 15 from verse 18 through to verse 25. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Up until this point in Jesus' farewell discourse, which began back at the beginning of chapter 14, he has taught some of the, the wonderful advantages that we are promised as we follow him. He has spoken about eternal life. He has spoken about access to the Father through prayer, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the home that, that Jesus has prepared for us in eternity. He has also urged us to abide in his love and that we are to love one another. But now there's a dramatic change as he warns that our love for him means that we will be hated by the world. Jesus had taught his disciples some of the blessings which come exclusively to those who follow him, partly because they were concerned that he was about to leave them. However, the emphasis now changes from the privileges of being a disciple of Christ to the persecution that they will face as a result of their decision to follow him. And eight times in the passage we're looking at today, Jesus uses the words hate or, or hatred. It's a strong word. But it was appropriate for the disciples 2,000 years ago. And it remains appropriate in our day. Because the truth is that the non-believing world hates Jesus Christ. And if you love him, the world hates you too. And Jesus begins by teaching his disciples that the world will hate them. And then he goes on to explain why, giving them three important reasons. Firstly, the world hates Christians because as he says in verse 19, you are not of the world. Now, of course, he's referring to the world system rather than the created world. The world system consists of those who live their lives in rebellion against the God who created them. And that's why they don't know him. First John 3 verse 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And in his introduction to the Gospel of John, speaking of Christ, he writes, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And that word know can also be translated as love. It's not just a head knowledge, but having a personal relationship with him. Those who do not know Christ as the Savior who came into the world do not know the Father who sent him. And that is a very bad place to be. This is this great divide which we have between the saved and the lost, and the reason that the, the, the lost hate the saved. Christians are not like the world, or at least we're not meant to be. The irony is that the world tells us that we need to strive for our own individuality and our own identity. But the truth is that the world wants us to conform to their ungodly and their evil patterns. And it's the refusal to conform that brings hatred. And Paul challenges us in Romans 12, verse 2, and he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The moment you refuse to conform to the world's standards and turn to Christ instead, you will be ostracized and you will be hated for making that choice. A second reason that Jesus gives for the world's hatred of his followers is also in verse 19, when he says, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Jesus has chosen his own as he calls us out of the world system. The one thing the world system hates more than anything else is to hear the truth that we are all sinners 
who need to be saved from the consequences of our sin. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. That is the mantra of the world. It's all about the pursuit of happiness and following your own heart. But the moment you talk about the need of a savior from sin, the world will turn on you. The world system hates Christ because it refuses to acknowledge the sin problem. And what are we commissioned by Christ to do? We are commissioned to share the gospel. And when we do it correctly, the first thing we talk about is the sin problem. Telling the lost that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their lives is not an offensive message because it is not the gospel. That will never bring the lost to salvation because it completely negates the need for a savior. Instead, we are to tell the world that there is bad news, but there's also good news. There is hope. If only they would turn from their sins, repent and accept the free gift of salvation, which God brings through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ alone. But it is this message which is hated more than anything else in the world today. And those who proclaim this message are hated. Non-believers don't shrug their shoulders and say, whatever, when they hear the gospel being presented. Instead, they are offended at the very suggestion that there might be sinners who are living under the righteous wrath of God. Thirdly, the world hates Christians because of their identification with and allegiance to Jesus Christ. And he said in verses 20 and 21, If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name. Why does the world hate Christians? The answer is simple. It's because the world hates Jesus Christ. And that leads to another question. Why is Jesus hated so much? And he actually answers that question in verses 22 through 24. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. The first reason for the world's hatred of Jesus is his teaching, his words. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. There are people that we might dislike or, or even hate for the things that they have said. Human history is littered with some extremely nasty individuals who through their twisted beliefs and ideologies have brought untold suffering and heartache for countless people. Also, we can all, all think of people who are arrogant, who are selfish and are mean and they're not nice people. And most of us try to avoid associating with people like that. But what about Jesus? He was none of those things. He was anything but arrogant. He was the most humble man who ever lived. Neither was he selfish, proven by the fact that he, the eternal creator of the universe, humbly took on frail human flesh. He became one of us for the purpose of dying a death that he did not deserve so that we could be saved from the eternal wrath that our sins deserve. Jesus also wasn't a mean person. Some people can be extremely nasty with the words that they speak. And we can all recall some very cutting words spoken to us many years ago. And try as we might, we cannot forget how mean and hurtful those words were. That can't be said of Jesus, though. He was never mean. He said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to, to 30, Come to me, all who labor and are, heavy, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So bearing all of this in mind, why is Jesus hated so much for what he taught and what he said? Because he exposed human sin. The world hates Jesus and it hates the Bible because he and his written word reveals the true nature of the human heart. And rebellious sinners don't want to hear the truth. 
They hate Christ because he spoke the truth and they know it. And the truth is that we are all guilty before God. But Jesus is not only hated for his words, but also his works. Verse 24, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. His works, just like his words, exposes human sin. And as we've seen throughout the Gospel of John, John refers to the miracles of Jesus as signs. Now, signs, by their very definition, point us to something or someone. And we must remember that Jesus never performed a miracle just for the sake of it. There was a purpose behind each of them. And that purpose was to point to himself as the Savior who came into the world. He said in John 5 verse 36, The works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And then chapter 10, 25 to 26, The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. And in chapter 14, verses 10 and 11, he said to Philip, The Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. The greatest work performed by Jesus while on earth was, of course, the sacrificial death that he was to suffer the next day as he bore the wrath of God at human sin. And that explains why his works, his miracles, are offensive to the world because they point to the cross. The cross of Christ is hated by the world because it not only exposes human sin, but it reveals that there is nothing that the world can do about it. And that merely adds to the hatred of Jesus. He is hated because he was doing the works of God. And just like the words of God, the works of God do the same thing. They reveal our sin and our depravity, Hence our need for a saviour. Christians are often surprised at the depth of the hatred that we experience, as well as some of the vitriol aimed at us by the unbelieving world. But we shouldn't be surprised. Jesus warned his disciples that this would happen, and it's not going to become any easier to be a Christ follower in this ever-darkening world. It is going to become harder with each passing day. Why does the world hate us? Because it hates Christ. And the world hates Christ because it hates God the Father. And Jesus said in verse, in verse 20, Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. What this means is that we must expect, rather than be surprised, at the persecution and the hatred that we face, because of our love for Christ. The world that crucified Jesus will not stop there. And history and current events have shown us that the persecution is extended to those who follow Jesus too. And this is something we need to be aware of. The world resp that responded to Jesus' teaching in anger will respond in the same way to those who proclaim the gospel. And what this means is that there is a cost to following Jesus. For now, for us in this little corner of the world, the persecution that we face is not much more than some ridicule and possibly the loss of a few friendships along the way. But it's not going to get any easier. If you have a look at the book of Acts, which records the early days of the Christian church, just after Jesus ascended to heaven, you can see the opposition that the apostles faced whenever they preached the gospel. Peter and John healed a crippled man and and they boldly proclaimed the gospel and so what happened then was they were then hauled before the council in chapter 4 and they were warned to stop preaching the gospel then peter filled with the holy spirit said to them rulers of the people and elders if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man by what means this man has been healed let it be known to all of you and to all the people of israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. 
This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So they ignored the council, and they went on preaching Jesus Christ as the only means of salvation. And we pick up the story in the next chapter, when they were arrested again and questioned again. The high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet you, are filled, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And then not long after this, Stephen was stoned. Stoned to death, the first of countless faithful followers of Jesus who have paid the ultimate price for their faith. And with the exception of John, who died in his 90s on the island of Patmos, all of the apostles were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said something which is extremely challenging in Matthew 10. Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. How do we respond when our faith is questioned? Warren Wesby wrote in his commentary on this very passage, The only way a believer can escape conflict is to deny Christ and compromise his witness, and this would be sin. Then the believer would be at war with God and with himself. We will be misunderstood and persecuted even by those who are closest to us. Yet we must not allow this to affect our witness. It is important that we suffer for Jesus' sake and for righteousness' sake, and not because we ourselves are difficult to live with. And this is important. There is a difference between the offense of the cross and offense of Christians. And I think that last phrase is helpful because it helps us to understand how we can be faithful to the gospel in the face of persecution and ridicule and even, even hatred. Paul wrote in, in Colossians 4 verse 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This is the key to speaking the truth without compromising the truth. We can speak in love, but we cannot compromise the truth. Because persecution, even if it is nothing more than ridicule, is guaranteed. J.C. Ryle said, Persecution, in short, is like the goldsmith's hallmark on real silver or gold. It is one of the marks of a converted man. And then Paul in Philippians 1.29, It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. We simply cannot afford to fall away from the faith because we have nothing else and we have no one else to turn to. When so many, you'll remember this from John chapter 6, when so many rejected Jesus and his teachings and walked away from him, he turned to his disciples and said to them, do you want to go away as well? And Peter's reply should be ours too. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And sadly, there are many professing Christians 
who either change the true gospel in order to make it less offensive to those who hate Christ, and there are some who fall away from the faith in the face of the world's hatred and persecution. Some do continue to believe in Jesus Christ, but they live so close to the world that it's hard to tell just what they believe. And this happens so subtly, and that makes it even more dangerous. Those of you who attend our Wednesday Bible study would have heard me say this before. We all have friends and family who are not Christians, people that we love dearly, and we are not to cut those people off. Remember, we are called to be salt and light in the world, and those people need to hear the truth. They need our prayers. But we must also remember at the same time that Jesus has called us out of the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. So our constant prayer should be that God would guard our hearts and keep us faithful to him. This is from Proverbs chapter 4, from verse 23. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Because as we've seen, particularly in the last couple of decades, the hatred of the world towards Jesus Christ and those who profess faith in him is gaining momentum. And this raises many questions. What will I do when I face persecution and hatred? Will I stay faithful to Christ, regardless of the cost, or will I fall away? We've all asked those questions of ourselves, and Jesus answers that for us. He goes on to remind his disciples, as, he, as we move into chapter 16, of the promised Holy Spirit, and those promises apply to us too. We're engaged in a battle, but we're not in this battle alone. In chapter 14, Jesus had taught his disciples about the Spirit. And now, immediately after telling them that they would be hated and persecuted for their faith, he reminds them once again that he will continue to guide and to protect them through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we'll look at that in more detail next week, because that promise applies to us as well. Finally, just because the world hates us and the truth we proclaim does not mean we are to hate the world. Our model is God himself. He loved the world so much that he sent his only son to be its savior. And as Warren Wesby said, the cross and the gospel may be offensive to the lost, but we are not to be offensive Christians. Our call is to love the lost and to love them enough to be bold yet gracious witnesses of the gospel. In verse 26, Jesus said they hated me without a cause. In other words, there was no valid reason for the world to hate him. But they did. So if the world hates us, let it not be because we have given them a valid reason to hate us. If we are going to be hated, let it be because we are gracious yet faithful witnesses of the love of God. And then just to close, we looked earlier at the struggle of the early apostles in Acts chapter 4 and 5. And this is how Luke records what happened at the end of chapter 5. A Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while, the apostles. And he said to the men of Israel, take care what you are about to do to these men. For before these days, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And then listen to this. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. Let us pray.
Father, your word is full of accounts of people who have suffered and suffered tremendously for boldly and faithfully proclaiming the gospel. By your grace and by your mercy, we have not yet reached that point in our lives in this corner of, the, of your vineyard. But there are no guarantees, and we have seen it in our own lifetime, how the opposition to the truth of God is being challenged more and more each and every day. And this concerns us, but it should not surprise us. As the Lord, we ask for boldness as we, in grace and in truth, proclaim the reality that there is hope to be found in you. Lord, give us words of wisdom and remind us that you are always with us by your Spirit. May we be faithful witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because, Lord, who else would we turn to? We have nowhere else to go except to you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.